The idea of the underdog who defies all odds and prevails in the face of defeat is a story that captures imaginations the world over. While the outnumbered and outgunned side is usually beaten, there are several examples throughout history where a smaller force somehow snatches victory from the jaws of defeat through a combination of strategy, cunning, and sheer determination. Here are five times the underdog triumphed against the odds that show that no matter how bleak things may seem, defeat is never a certainty. Number 5. The Great Siege of Malta Being surrounded, isolated, outnumbered 6 to 1, and facing a well-supplied elite army of soldiers belonging to the world's only superpower might sound like a hopeless situation, but it's exactly the situation that a ragtag band of just a few hundred crusader knights found themselves in during the summer of 1565, as their base on the tiny Mediterranean island of Malta was besieged by an Ottoman invasion force containing 40,000 men who were intent on erasing this last enclave of crusader knights from the face of the earth. While lesser men might have given in to despair and fear, the handful of knights refused to surrender and went on to put up a defence of the island that would become legendary for the level of bravery and barbarism involved, as both sides fought without mercy and the fate of Europe hung in the balance. The Order of Knights of the Hospital of St. John had been founded some 450 years earlier during the Crusades and were originally tasked with caring for pilgrims to the Holy Lands who had fallen ill. Yet the Order quickly expanded and grew into a sizable band of formidable warrior knights, the men recruited from across Europe to defend Christendom and assist in the Crusades. Yet times had changed and the world was now a very different place. With the modern idea of nation-states now transforming the European map, the knights were seen as relics from a bygone era, the idea of a multinational force of religious zealots viewed as an outdated medieval concept. With the Crusades long over, the knights lacked their original purpose and seemed destined to fade into extinction. However, after relocating to the island of Rhodes, they found a new purpose in the turmoil created as a result of rising tensions between the Christian European powers and the Islamic Ottoman Empire as the two sides clashed to decide who would control the Mediterranean Sea. From their base in Rhodes, the knights played an active role in harassing Ottoman shipping and quickly proved themselves to be a major thorn in the Sultan's side, yet it wasn't long before such activities provoked a reaction, and in 1522 the Ottomans besieged Rhodes and expelled the knights from the island. However, in an act of mercy, the Sultan allowed the knights to leave with their lives and their weapons, rather than destroying them while he had the chance a decision which would come back to haunt him just a few years later. The knights now found themselves homeless. However, in 1530, the Holy Roman Emperor granted the Order's Grand Master control over the island of Malta. The knights quickly turned Malta into a formidable naval base, the island's position in the middle of the Mediterranean, making it a highly strategic gateway between east and west. From their new home, the knights once again resumed naval operations against the Ottomans and their pirate allies, who had for centuries plagued European coastlines with their raids. However, once again the band of knights would find themselves occupying land that the Sultan wished to add to his vast empire, as the Ottoman Empire set its sights upon the island of Malta. The Ottoman hammer fell against the island on the 18th of May 1565, and after bringing their massive guns ashore, the Ottomans began bombarding the 500 knights who were now supported by a couple of thousand troops drawn from the island's population. The first target was Fort St. Elmo, a formidable structure which guarded the entrance of the Grand Harbour and needed to be neutralised to secure a landing point for the rest of the Ottoman fleet. Three dozen guns bombarded the outpost over four weeks, during which thousands of cannonballs reduced to the thick stone walls to rubble, slowly whittling down the 500 men inside, who despite suffering horrific losses, refused to even contemplate surrender. This sideshow of a siege was dragging on for far too long, the stubborn resistance of the garrison inside wasting the precious summer weeks and costing the Ottomans badly needed supplies and men. When the fort finally fell, even the wounded knights manned the walls with whatever weapons they could lay their hands on, prepared to meet death, but not before taking a few Ottoman soldiers with them. All 1500 defenders were killed as the ruins of the fort was overwhelmed. However, the cost for this minor victory had been crippling, with the Ottomans losing 8,000 of their best troops and suffering a serious blow to morale. Furious at the defiance of the dead knights, the Ottoman commander had their corpses decapitated and their headless bodies placed on mock crucifixes, which were floated across the harbour to the knights' headquarters at Fort St. Angelo, no doubt in an effort to strike fear into the hearts of the few hundred men stationed there. 
Yet the Knights Grand Master was not so easily intimidated, responding by beheading all of the Ottoman prisoners he had taken so far, loading their severed heads into his cannons and firing them back at the Turkish camp. As the Ottomans set their sights on the final bastion of the Knights at Fort St. Angelo, it was clear that no mercy would be shown on either side. In the days that followed, both sides displayed incredible heroism and cruelty in the hand-to-hand -hand combat that ensued as the Ottomans launched 10 attacks on the formidable walls of the fort, using their 65 siege guns to fire an estimated 130,000 cannonballs in what may have been the largest bombardment in history so far. Yet time and time again they were thrown back, with at one point the 70-year-old Grand Master of the Knights emerging to lead his men from the front at breaches in the wall forcing back the attacking Ottomans with great swings of his sword, his very presence inspiring the few knights left alive to ever greater feats of bravery. As summer drew to an end, the once confident Ottoman army was now gripped by a sense of impending failure, having lost as many as 30,000 men in the drawn-out sieges on the island, and when an 8,000-strong Christian relief force landed on the island on September the 7th, what little morale had remained instantly dissolved resulting in a general Ottoman retreat as the soldiers ran for their ships. Against all the odds, these relics of a long dead age had sacrificed their lives repelling a full-on assault from the superpower of the age, the handful of wounded survivors who had somehow made it through the siege, becoming heroes across Europe, their last stand an incredible demonstration of what a handful of dedicated men can achieve when fear of defeat is erased from the mind. Number 4. The Winter War while technically a defeat in which land was lost to the enemy, the very fact that the nation of Finland survived such a mismatched contest at all seems like nothing short of a miracle, and a shining example of how the human desire to defend the home can trump even the most imbalanced of odds, as a million-man strong Soviet invasion force desperately fought to subdue the Finns over the cold winter of 1939. The overconfident invaders taught a deadly lesson in how strategy, terrain, and motivation can overcome sheer numbers, as over 150,000 Soviet soldiers perished in the snow in just three short months. Finland had been a part of the Russian Empire for most of the 19th century, however with the chaos unleashed by the rise of the Bolsheviks, the Finns saw an opportunity to regain their independence, while the Soviets were still weakened from civil war and broke away from the Russian Empire in December 1917. Yet despite Lenin recognizing the newly independent Finland, Soviet leaders still saw the breakaway territory as firmly within their sphere of influence, with some no doubt harboring desires to fully reconquer the lost land at some point in the future. This desire became the official foreign policy of the Soviet Union with the rise of Stalin, a man who was determined to restore the borders of the old Russian Empire by diplomacy or direct force, recapturing the vast amount of land lost during the chaos of the revolution and civil war just two decades earlier. When the land was lost, the fledgling Soviet Union was too weak to hold onto it, but now times had changed and Stalin commanded a vast war machine which he intended to put to use. The non-aggression pact signed between Germany and the Soviet Union provided the perfect opportunity for Stalin to begin expanding his European borders, the pact including a secret protocol which divided Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe into separate Soviet and German spheres of influence. The Baltic states were forced to accept treaties allowing the Soviets to station troops on their soil, and it wasn't long before similar demands were made of the Finns. Stalin claimed vast tracts of Finnish land on the border with the Soviet Union, under the guise that doing so would protect the crucial city of Leningrad, which was only 20 miles from the border, and therefore seen as vulnerable. However, the land which was claimed contained much of Finland's border defences. Ceding this territory to the Soviet Union would leave Finland vulnerable, and the rest of the country wide open to invasion. With distrust of the Russians running high, it's no surprise that such demands were refused. However, the country had a population of just 4 million people, and could not even come close to matching the military capabilities of the Soviets, who had 3 times as many soldiers, 30 times as many aircraft, and 100 times as many tanks, with a large economic base to supply such a formidable war machine. A suspicious border incident where a Soviet guard post was supposedly shelled by the Finnish army provided the justification needed for war. However, it's widely suspected that the incident was a false flag carried out by the Soviet secret police. Nevertheless, Soviet forces invaded on the 30th of November 1939, 
as half a million men crossed the border to seize the territory they had earlier laid claim to. However, many historians believe that the real intention was to conquer all of Finland and install a puppet communist government. With such an overwhelming force, Stalin was confident that the Red Army would make short work of the Finns, with some commanders boasting that the war would be over in just two weeks. However, the Finns were about to throw a humiliating spanner in the works. While on paper the Red Army looked to be impressive, with its huge advantage in men, materials and weapons, the reality was far less straightforward. Stalin's vicious purges throughout the 1930s had left the Red Army's leadership decimated, with over half of its officer corps eliminated. In many cases the positions made vacant filled by less experienced and often incompetent individuals who were selected primarily for their loyalty rather than their ability. In addition to this, all military decisions made by unit commanders on the front lines had to first be approved by a political commissar who would evaluate strategies based upon political criteria, a system of dual command which would wreak havoc during the battles to come. Yet the Soviets didn't have to only deal with internal issues. Finland itself was a mass of untamed wilderness, with few roads or tracks to speak of forcing the troops to move through hazardous terrain that was often nothing more than dense forest and treacherous swamp, a situation made worse by the bitter winter of 1939-1940, which saw temperatures fall as low as minus 45. Countless thousands died in the ice before even firing a shot, the poorly trained troops wading through the snow on foot, while their Finnish enemies made effective use of skis to remain mobile rapidly moving to wherever they were needed most, where they could concentrate their smaller numbers more effectively. Many Red Army units lacked basic supplies such as suitable winter tents and snow camouflage, and were thus reduced to sleeping with whatever cover they could forage, resulting in casualty rates as high as 10% caused by frostbite before even crossing the Finnish border. When battle did commence, their regular khaki uniforms made them easy targets for the Finns who were wearing snow camouflage, which rendered them almost invisible to the Soviets, resulting in waves of Red Army soldiers being cut down before the enemy was even sighted. The Soviet advantage in technology was also blunted by a clever use of simple but ingenious homemade weapons, the Finns effectively using logs and crowbars to jam the wheels of Soviet tanks while the famous Molotov cocktail was mass-produced and used to deadly effect as the Finnish soldiers waged a guerrilla war in the snow-laden forests. Fighting for their homes, morale amongst the Finns was far higher than the Soviets, who were forced to fight or be shot by their own side. Even running was no longer an option, as the inhospitable terrain would mean a quick death for any man caught out in the open alone. Yet despite making the humiliated Soviet army bleed for every mile of land, the Russian juggernaut could not be held off forever, and after adopting new tactics and reinforcing with hundreds of thousands more men, a renewed offensive eventually broke through the Finnish lines. As winter drew to a close, it became clear that the Finnish forces had no hope of holding out any longer, and by March a peace treaty was signed in which 11% of Finland was ceded to the Soviet Union. Yet despite losing territory, the rest of the country had survived an attack which was expected to have eclipsed them in a matter of days, making it through the war with their independence intact and exposing the many weaknesses of the Soviet Red Army, weaknesses which may have encouraged the Germans to attack the USSR a year later. Number 3. The Battle of Red Cliffs One of the largest naval battles in history would see a 400-year-old dynasty come crashing down as a massively outnumbered alliance of just 50,000 men took on an attacking force at least five times their number to decide the future course of China. The shockwave of the battle ushering in the Three Kingdoms period of Chinese history that would see decades of warfare and bloodshed as China was torn apart by three competing states. The 3rd century had already been a time of great turmoil for China, with the ruling Han Emperor reduced to little more than a figurehead, as regional warlords constantly fought each other to expand their personal domains. Yet one of these warlords was rapidly growing far stronger than the others. A man named Cao Cao had managed to unify all of northern China under his personal rule. However, his ambitions did not end there, and he now intended to unite the whole of China with himself as its supreme ruler. Amassing a huge army numbering perhaps a quarter of a million men, he turned his sights south, intending to gain control of the strategically important Yangtze River, the capture of which was necessary if he was to have any hope of defeating the southern warlords and realising his dream of a united China. The campaign in the south started successfully, with Cao Cao winning several engagements against his enemies until just two warlords remained. 
However, realizing that they would be overwhelmed if they tried to fight him independently, the remaining southern leaders decided to band together and form a final alliance to oppose Cao Cao's advance. With just 50,000 men, this southern alliance prepared to stand against an invading army that outnumbered them at least 5 to 1. The battle opened with a minor skirmish that saw Cao Cao's army unable to press their numerical advantage as the men were exhausted from their long forced march south and weakened by unfamiliar tropical diseases which their enemies were largely immune to. Seeing the poor performance of his men, Cao Cao retreated north of the river, intending to cross the river by ship after his men had time to rest. Yet his army mainly consisted of cavalry and infantry, the generals and soldiers having little experience of life aboard a ship. While Cao Cao had a huge fleet of thousands of ships, his soldiers found the transition from land to sea difficult, and many of them were soon racked by seasickness as the mass of ships rocked back and forth on the choppy waves. With battle the last thing on their minds as the men struggled to acclimatize to life aboard a ship, Cao Cao made his next error, ordering his ships to be chained together in an attempt to make them more stable and thus prevent his soldiers from getting seasick. When the southern warlords saw Cao Cao's ships tied together, they saw an opportunity to smash the northern invaders in one cunning action. One of their generals sent Cao Cao a letter in which he pretended to offer his surrender and switch sides, bringing his fleet of ships containing thousands of soldiers with him. Cao Cao accepted the fake surrender, however instead of being loaded with fresh troops, the southern general's fleet was instead stacked with kindling and oil. As the renegade ships approached Cao Cao's densely packed fleet, the crew set them ablaze before fleeing in small boats, allowing the wind to carry the burning fire ships head on into Cao Cao's fleet which was now unable to maneuver out of their way due to the chains binding them together. The prized fleet was turned into a bonfire as the flames spread at lightning speed, hungrily devouring every ship they touched, burning to death or drowning thousands of desperate men who now had no escape route. Those few who were untouched by the flames and had time to sever the chains binding their ships fled in terror, however there would be no escape on this day as the southern armies ruthlessly pursued the invaders as they desperately attempted to make their way through trails which had been turned into little more than muddy bogs by days of heavy rain. In the ensuing massacre, thousands perished either drowning in the muddy fields, trampled by the stampeding crowd or cut to pieces by the blades of the pursuing southern soldiers. Cao Cao's prized army of a quarter of a million men had been utterly crushed, the man himself running for his life back to his home base in the north of China, where he would remain contained, never again to be in a position to threaten his rival warlords. Tactical errors and the assumption that sheer numbers could overwhelm his enemies had cost him his only chance to establish a new dynasty and rule the entirety of China, an error that would bring about the dawn of a dark and bloody era in Chinese history as the land was divided into three competing kingdoms whose struggle for dominance would doom millions to oblivion. Number 2. The Battle of Myongyang a man who had received no formal naval training and had just recently been imprisoned and tortured by his own people was given command of the shattered remnants of the Korean Navy which had now been reduced to just 13 ships following a disastrous battle conducted by the previous admiral. This tiny fleet of ships the final obstacle preventing total Japanese domination of Korea. In October 1597, a fleet of 333 Japanese ships was dispatched to remove this final thorn from their side. However, in the battle that followed, Admiral Yi Sun Shin would ascend to the status of legend, becoming arguably the greatest naval commander in history after defeating the Japanese navy despite being outnumbered by an incredible 10 to 1. Having just emerged from a period of civil war during which the warring clans of Japan were unified into one nation, the new Japanese ruler had no intentions of settling into peace, and in 1592 he ordered an invasion of Korea which he intended to use as a forward base for further conquests in China. 158,000 troops landed on the Korean peninsula, the well-trained and battle-hardened Japanese army quickly advancing north as they took several Korean cities and castles. However, the arrival of Chinese reinforcements slowed down their advance, and with raids on their supply fleets, conducted by the Korean Navy under Admiral Yi, the arrival of crucial military supplies such as food, weapons and reinforcements ground to a halt, forcing the Japanese to withdraw south. A stalemate quickly ensued as the Chinese and Korean forces were unable to expel the Japanese from the castles and forts that they held in the south. 
while the Japanese were unable to advance any further north due to Admiral Yi's string of victories at sea. The Japanese commanders knew that while Admiral Yi prowled the open waters, no Japanese ship would be safe, and that if the invasion was to succeed, the troublesome Admiral had to somehow be eliminated. A plot was hatched to exploit the many internal divisions which existed inside the Korean ruling dynasty. A Japanese double agent was dispatched to earn the trust of a high-ranking Korean general, and after gaining the man's confidence, the spy informed the general of an imminent attack to be carried out by the Japanese navy. The spy urged the general to send Admiral Yi with his fleet to ambush the Japanese, however after receiving orders to do so, Admiral Yi refused. The location of the phony attack was littered with dangerous rock formations which would have destroyed any ship which attempted to sail there, however Yi's refusal to follow orders was seized upon by his political enemies at court, who had him stripped of his rank, arrested, and subjected to tortures that almost saw him killed. His life was only spared thanks to intervention by his supporters, who convinced the king to spare his life due to his impeccable past service record. The admiral was released back into the navy and demoted to a lower rank, however instead of wallowing in bitterness, he simply bided his time, perhaps confident that his services would be required again soon. The admiral who replaced Yi proved to be a disastrous choice, and squandered most of the Korean fleet in an avoidable battle after being caught unaware by a far larger Japanese force. The shocked king immediately pardoned and reinstated Yi to the rank of admiral, however the once mighty Korean navy now consisted of a mere 13 warships, a force far too small to pose any serious threat to the Japanese, who now believed that they had free and unfettered access to the sea, which they could use to supply their army and restart the stalled invasion of Korea and China. Yet Admiral Yi's reputation persisted, and after a Korean scouting ship was sighted near their base, the Japanese navy decided to pursue the scout in the hopes that he might lead them back to Yi and the remains of the Korean navy, where this minor threat could be destroyed once and for all. Yet Admiral Yi was no fool. The scout ship was bait, intended to lure the Japanese into his masterful trap, bait which had arrogantly been taken. Yi was waiting at a narrow strait known as the Roaring Channel because of the powerful tidal forces at work, forces which Yi had studied extensively and intended to use to his advantage. Aware that the tides changed their direction every three hours, he realised that he could use their power to aid him in the coming battle if timed perfectly. The narrow strait neutralised the massive Japanese numerical advantage by forcing them to attack in smaller groups while the powerful tides prevented effective manoeuvring. Yi anchored his warships at the northern end of the strait and advanced against the tidal current with just his lone flagship towards the 333 Japanese ships at the other end of the strait, fully aware that the crew of his 12 other ships were terrified and keen to flee from the overwhelming force of the Japanese. Seeing their admiral fighting alone yet still holding out against the onslaught of the Japanese vanguard and the treacherous waters, the rest of Yi's fleet rushed forward to join him in the fight. It was then that Yi's master plan unfolded, as the tidal current switched direction and began propelling the Korean ships forward while pushing back against the Japanese advance, causing their tightly packed formations to collide with each other as ships spilled their crews of men into the open waters, where they quickly drowned in the whirlpools and swirling chaos. Yi seized the initiative and ordered his ships to begin ramming the disorganized Japanese fleet, which was now so tightly pressed together that hitting them with cannon shot was like shooting fish in a barrel. In the ensuing slaughter, 30 Japanese warships were sunk, with the loss of 8,000 men, while Admiral Yi lost just two of his crew and zero ships. The Japanese navy was forced to retreat in shame, the shock of such an improbable defeat crushing the morale while rallying the beleaguered Korean and Chinese armies. Now joined by the Chinese navy, Admiral Yi continued to wage war against the invaders before eventually succumbing to death after being hit by a bullet in battle as the Japanese were on the verge of being finally pushed out of Korea, his name now legendary as a man who remained undefeated despite constantly being outnumbered in the over 23 separate battles he fought during his prestigious career. Number 1. The Battle of Agincourt 
On St Crispin's Day of 1415, something akin to a medieval massacre occurred just 25 miles south of Calais in northern France, as a small force of perhaps less than 9,000 exhausted and disease-ridden English soldiers faced an onslaught of as many as 36,000 heavily armoured French knights intent on their destruction. As night fell on the eve of battle, the English invaders made their peace with God, sure that the next day's combat would see their lives put to a bloody end. However, a series of factors would conspire together and result in an English victory that would echo through the ages as a near-perfect example of the hopelessly outmatched underdog achieving victory against all the odds. Just two months earlier, a confident King Henry V of England had invaded France with an army of 12,000 men, hoping to take advantage of internal divisions within France to press his own claim to the French throne. However, his invasion got off to a bad start, becoming bogged down at the Siege of Harfleur, which took far longer to capture than expected, with the now weakened and disease-ridden English army not leaving the captured port until October the 8th. Precious time had been lost at the siege, and winter was fast approaching. Yet Henry was unwilling to simply retire back to England, having spent a fortune in gold for the capture of just one town, and instead decided to march his remaining 9,000 men through the territory of Normandy to the English port of Calais on the northern French coast, in something of a show of force, for he knew very well that if he didn't press his claim, his claim would be forgotten. Yet his route back to the safety of Calais and a boat home was blocked off by the French, who had not been sitting idly by, and had raised an impressive army of 20,000 men to bar his path. With the French army growing in size with each day that passed, as more men flocked to their banners, and with the English army growing weaker as disease, exhaustion and hunger took their toll, King Henry came to the stark realisation that delaying battle any further would only make the already immense task that lay ahead of him even harder, and so on the 25th he ordered his army to advance on the French position. Knowing full well that his chances of victory were slim at best, the night before battle was a solemn affair in the English camp, as the men prayed and made their confessions before God, resigned to the violent death that was certain to await them the next day, while in the French camp, soldiers spent the night in drunken celebration, taunting the English arrayed against them across the field, certain that the next morning would bring them a glorious and complete victory, even going so far as to prepare a specially painted cart, which they intended to use as a vehicle in which to parade the humiliated English king after he was captured, However, King Henry had made it clear to his men that he had no intention of being taken alive. As the sun rose on the 25th of October, the English did whatever they could to eke out some advantage and improve their chances of survival, deploying on open ground between two woods, which would help protect their flanks from the dangerous French cavalry, and placing their archers on either side of the infantry, the deadly longbowmen protected by sharpened wooden stakes which had been driven into the ground in front of them to fend off enemy cavalry charges. However, this clever use of the terrain was unlikely to change the seemingly inevitable outcome of the battle. Outnumbered as much as six to one, the English braced themselves for an attack, yet no attack was forthcoming, the French content to sit back and wait as thousands more reinforcements were on their way. King Henry's hand was forced, and he ordered his men to march forward to within longbow range of the enemy, where they re-established their defences and began firing off hails of arrows on the French lines, hoping to bait the French into charging before their reinforcements arrived, which would make an already bleak situation even more hopeless. Enraged by the arrow fire from longbowmen who they considered to be nothing more than inferior commoners, the high-born French knights disregarded their orders to hold back, and instead charged forward against the English, keen to slaughter the peasant longbowmen and to capture the English nobles, who could be ransomed after the battle for a hefty price. Yet the large horses provided easy targets for the massed ranks of English longbows, as dense waves of arrows were fired into the charging French knights, impaling hundreds at a time, thanks to the armour-piercing bodkin arrowheads, or simply knocking the armoured nobles to the muddy ground, their now injured and panicking horses, unleashing chaos as they galloped out of control through the lines of French infantry who were advancing behind the cavalry, crushing hundreds of their own side beneath their hooves. Unable to get to the hated longbowmen due to the surrounding woodland and forest of razor-sharp stakes in the ground, the cavalry charge was smashed by the unending torrent of arrows, the attack instead cluttering the narrow battlefield with the bodies of horses and dead knights, as well as churning up the already treacherous muddy ground, which was now resembling a waterlogged swamp, thanks to the hooves of the horses combined with the immense amount of rain which had fallen in the days leading up to the battle. 
The French men-at-arms now faced the prospect of advancing on foot across a 300-yard-long killing ground, while under a bombardment of arrows that to the modern mind is difficult to imagine, the well-trained archers able to fire 12 arrows a minute, arrows which could wound at 400 yards, and penetrate even the thickest armour at 100 yards. With perhaps 5,000 English archers present on the battlefield, it's reasonable to suggest that as many as 1,000 arrows per second rain down upon the French soldiers, the men forced to endure a storm of hundreds of thousands of arrows before they even reached the English lines. As hundreds were slaughtered with each passing minute, the knights pushed forward through the thick mud, stepping over the arrow-pricked bodies of their comrades. The effort of wading through the nightmarish terrain while wearing armour that weighed as much as 60 pounds, rapidly sapping their strength, so much so that by the time they reached the English lines, many of the French soldiers were all but completely exhausted, becoming easy prey for the fresh and eager English foot soldiers who simply had to knock the encumbered men to the ground, the French knights struggling to ever rise again once they had fallen into the mud. In a horrific twist of fate, the expensive armour that they had worn for protection would for many prove their undoing, the men sinking into the mud under the weight of the heavy plate armour, where hundreds drowned in the mixture of dirty water, mud and blood that now flooded into the tight confines of their steel helmets. The great press of men was made worse as more waves of knights rushed in from behind, pushing those on the front lines straight on to the waiting lances of the English, the soldiers becoming so closely packed together that they were unable to swing their swords to attack. Such a sea of men meant that the longbowmen on the flanks no longer needed to even aim, as they fired the last of their arrows into the French at point-blank range, before dropping their bows and switching to fearsome hatchets, daggers and hammers, the men rushing in to wreak slaughter amongst the enemy. Unlike the popular perception of archers in modern culture as being slender and agile, these were muscular, powerful men who would have no problem caving in an armoured skull with a blow from their hammers, Men who had worked for years to build up the immense strength necessary to draw a full-sized longbow. The battlefield became a charnel house as the remaining French desperately fought to stay alive on top of a mountain of the dead and dying, while the English gleefully finished off as many of the enemy as they could, stabbing, smashing and in many cases simply pulling up the victim's helmet visor to thrust a dagger through the trapped man's eye. The English army were on the brink of an unimaginable victory, however the slaughter was not over. A French attack on the English rear made King Henry believe that the great number of French prisoners he had taken might attempt to break out and rejoin the fight, and so he ordered his men to immediately put them to death, despite this act being against the code of chivalry which demanded that captured nobles be ransomed after a battle. Over the course of just three hours, as many as 10,000 French soldiers were killed, with the English suffering perhaps just a few hundred losses. In a single day, the French governing elite had been cut to pieces, and King Henry had won one of the greatest military victories in history, yet he would not live long enough to see his claim to the French throne fulfilled, dying just two years later from dysentery. Yet despite this, the Battle of Agincourt remains as proof that seemingly insurmountable odds can be overcome with the right strategy and the desire to never give in. So those are my choices for 5 times the underdog won against the odds. Let me know which other examples you know of in the comments below, and I'll see you again soon.